Well, hello, everyone. I don't feel too prodigal. Uh, appreciated the, the sermonette very much. You know, I, uh, it's wonderful to see all of you. I've seen parts of you. Um, it's wonderful to see, know that you're wearing pants and shoes, um, which I always do. I, if you ever need proof of that on the Zoom thing, I will be happy to show you my shoes. I, I just do it. Um, I, Mr. Thomas has learned over the years not to put me in charge of certain critical parts of church functioning, one of which would be projecting the lyrics. Because if I were back there projecting lyrics, I would rewrite them all to say, I guess it's for the people at home. Um, I, I, I thought it was just sweet. I was standing back there humming the hymns. Taya would poke me because I sang the first line of every hymn. And um, Pedro, my brother, turned around and looked at me and he was trying to make sure that I could see the lyrics okay and he moved over. And I really appreciated that. I couldn't hum any better if I saw the lyrics than if I, than if I didn't. But it's sweet. And actually, you know, the point is we think the words. Um, we, we hum, but we think the words. Um, it's a it's a difficult time, but I'm I'm very glad to be here. Glad to see you all doing well. Um, glad that we operate as a family. That we pray for each other. We'll be praying for Glenn's surgery. Um, praying for Walt and everybody. Um, incidentally, I I talked to the Wrangell family, and I think Mrs. Wrangell's doing quite a bit better, uh, which is what we would would hope for. Um, Anyway, uh, we, we work that way. Whether in, in, in all times, God watches how we respond to this kind of thing because it really does help us grow um, towards his family and towards his kingdom. Um, I, I wanted to tell you about a, a visit that our daughter and son-in-law made. They live in Seattle and they've been sending us pictures and it looks like the book of Revelation. It really does. Where the sky is red, and um, I keep thinking of Maddie, and, and uh, you know, but she, I think she's in Ohio, right? And um, what a, Ohio's a good place to be compared to out there on the West Coast. They, they really have breathing troubles. Their smoke alarms go off. They didn't know what was going on. And um, even the coastal areas where the wind normally blows from the ocean are getting the smoke. It's very, and there's nowhere to go. I mean, you could drive to Ohio. We've offered a room to our kids, but uh, they haven't taken us up on it yet. But um, one time they visited us for Thanksgiving. I was having trouble with my internet and I couldn't access the internet. Well, I'd restarted it. It was my fault. And um, I had to type in the password and I couldn't remember what the password was. And um, it's nice to have an IT person married to your daughter. He's very good. He works as a software engineer and um, he figured out how to do it. It isn't hard. Um, and now I could do it myself that, that it, there's a way to access your own password. You've got it recorded in the system. And I did. And um, <laughs> he looked at the password and he said, really? <laughs> and I said, yeah. And the password was do not forget. <laughs> and um, <laughs> um, Except it was in old French because I didn't want it to be accessible to everyone. So it said, it said, ne oublie. And ne oublie means don't forget. But it happens to be the motto of the, the grand and historic Graham clan. Ne oublie. Uh, the Grahams go back more than a thousand years in history. Um, parts of them are a very noble clan. There are other parts also. Um, the parts of the Grams were, were uh, aristocrats and lived in castles and, and uh, were contributors to Scottish society. My wife and I have stood in St. Giles Cathedral in Edinburgh in front of the tomb of Sir John Graham, who was the family patriarch. Um, unfortunately, his most famous claim to fame was they, after he died, they cut his body in 12 parts and sent it all over Scotland as a message to how we treat grams in the world, <laughs> but um, it, it ended up actually helping the history and helping it to work out. Uh, 
there's another clan. My father, when I, there's the Highland Grahams and there's the Lowland Grahams. And um, my father was big on Graham uh, history and wanted us to know it. And um, he was always a little reserved when it came to my asking, well, which are we? Are we the Grahams of Menteith or the Grahams of Montrose? Because the Montrose was the lords and ladies. The Menteith people, live down near the borderlands and there's a whole book written about them and the McGregors and the Campbells. They were most famous for stealing cattle. Uh, that's what they did. And um, it's well known. It's not just a legend. It happened. The Grams were the people who stole the cattle. Um, they were encouraged to go to America, many of them, and um, encouraged often from a jail cell. And uh, they often went through Ireland on their way to America, and people who did that are now called the Scotch-Irish. I used to think Scotch-Irish meant a, a mixture of the two heritages, but it's Scottish people who filtered their way through Northern Ireland. And I know very little about the exact people in my Graham heritage. I know my mother's side very well. They were honest, hardworking craftsmen, but my father's side, even though we say we're related to the nobles, they were the cattle wrestlers, and they came through Ireland and were encouraged to come to America, and we're here. They made the odd choice of settling in Topeka, Kansas, which is a strange place to allow cattle wrestlers to come in, but it, it, it worked out. But the motto is Ne Oublie. We're very proud of that. We're proud that our motto is Ne Oublie. We will never forget our motto, which is Ne Oublie. The trouble is, None of us can quite remember what it is that we're not supposed to forget. And there's something back there. I think part of it is that we're Grahams, we're the great, the great and wonderful Grahams. And Scottish history was romanticized in the 1800s. It was changed from what it was before that. And that's when the kilts and the clans and the bagpipes came in. And it, it's, it's very different from what it was back in those days. And now it's a, a noble thing to pursue. But of course, there were many sides of it. Um, but we always remember that we are never to forget. I've changed my password since then, by the way, so you can feel free to come and, and try it all you want to. Um, it was interesting, and I don't mean to joke about this on a more somber note, that yesterday you couldn't drive around town or be anywhere on the internet without seeing people telling you in some way, shape, or form never to forget, but for different reasons. September 11th, of course, is embedded in all of our minds, e even the people who weren't alive then they know about it and it's the the thing that people can tell you is where they were when when the events started to happen it's something that we never forget i'd like to think that in the kingdom there will be a time to forget it but for now in the united states it's something that we never forget so we use that phrase quite a bit in our own society also but right now in this very strange year in these very strange times uh, when, when so many things seem to be doubling down on us, and it isn't so bad that one thing happens, but, but so many different events, you know, the riots and the unrest, the fires, the droughts, um, the, the uh, tensions around the world, and of course, the, the virus and the pandemic and the isolating and the ways that we have to deal with that, and the challenges that it presents for us. In the middle of all that, the words do not forget are a key to survival, to remember what we ought to be doing and what we're on earth for. Because as God has said, as Jesus said, we're to be in the world, but not of the world. We function in the world. We're aware of what's happening, but we're not of the world. We're people with a different story, people with a different sense of what is going to come, people with, with different allegiances. We see the things that drive us crazy, and, and they do, uh, regardless of how we feel about um, people who are in power or people who are challenged and that kind of thing, regardless of how we feel about it, the stories that come out just drive you crazy. And you can't believe, and, and it's on, the, you can't just attach it to one person. There, are, there are, It's so hard to find out what truth even is anymore. And, and does any of it make sense? And uh, for a country that, that we all love and has been so dear to all of us and means so much to us and has meant so much to the end of the world, to see it change so quickly is a heavy burden on us. And, and yet we still have to live our lives. Somehow we have to eat and have housing and 
and drink and deal with people. We have to pay our bills. We have to survive. And the way to survive is to never forget what God has given us. Because we are people of the story. We are people who've been given a story. Sometimes it's called the gospel. Sometimes it's called the good news. That's the literal translation. We have this story and we've been given it. And all, it's quite a wide ranging story, but in some ways it's also a very simple story because God will take people, imperfect people, people who've grown up with all the challenges of the world from the very beginnings of the Garden of Eden till now, and there have been many different challenges, and everyone has viewed the challenges through their own framework. Um, you know, there will be people who are resurrected who won't know anything about 2020. It's kind of a comforting thought, but they had their own challenges and sometimes much worse. Sometimes they lost their lives. Sometimes their lives were complete misery. Sometimes they existed oblivious to all that, you know, just in, in luxury. There's been all kinds of stories, but we have our own story. We used to have a a hymn in our United Church of God hymn before it was revised called We've a Story to Tell to the Nations. And that's what God has told us to do. Uh, it was a very good hymn. I don't know why it was taken out. The chorus went, the darkness shall turn to dawning and the dawning to noonday bright. And Christ's great kingdom shall come on earth, the kingdom of love and light. And I love that hymn. And it meant quite a bit to me. And the good news is, <laughs> well, not the good news. It's good that that hymn still exists, and I can sing it any time I want to, ha, ha, ha. But it's not in our hymnal anymore is the thing, and I'm not sure why it was taken out. You know, uh, there's a hymn that I wrote in the hymnal called Wake My Heart. And one of the um, ways that I learned to grow after submitting those hymns was that it was decided that certain things would be changed in the words. And I said, no. And they said, well, then we won't use it. And I said, well, let's talk. And so if you look at the hymns, sometimes down at the bottom, it'll say, what does it say? It's a phrase. Um, I have no idea what number weight my heart is. But that's why they have an index. It's 123. And at the bottom, well, it doesn't say it there. But sometimes it says, oh, but if you look at 124, which is across the page, when it says text, there's a comma, and it says A-L-T. And that means alternate, meaning they decided to change the words on it. Um, in the case of Wake My Heart, it's a small change, but it's one that meant something to me. And it says, every land must hear the word. That's what's in the hymnal. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, that's true. But when I wrote it, it was, every land must hear the news. And news is the little tr literal translation. And that's what, the news is actually what Jesus told us to take to the world. It's actually what we were given. And so I've never understood why that had to be changed. Um, to me, news is, is the story. News is what's dear to my heart. And news is the way that it was phrased in the New Testament, that what we have to tell to the nations. The gospel is for everyone. It's for the whole world. And it has to reach the whole world. I mean, part of before Christ returns is the gospel must be preached to all nations. So Christ's return depends on human activity at that point. It's tied to it, which is a scary thought, that the salvation of the world is tied into our own actions, but it should sober us up, but at the same time also inspire us. However, there is one part of the gospel that we should never forget that is meant there for us. It's okay if we tell other people about it. I mean, it's part of the whole story. But this part of it is to inspire us in times like this. It's something for us to think about. It's been given to us, and God talks about it, and Jesus in, in the scriptures talks about it very explicitly. It's the part of the gospel that is for you and for me. And it's to help us get through these times. And you know, if you understand this part of the gospel, you understand the whole gospel. So it, it isn't separate from what we tell the world, but it's very inspiring. And it's what Abraham thought about while he was sitting out in the plains of Mamre in his tents under the big trees, looking out over the plains. It's what Abraham thought about. Abraham never actually took part in what I'm going to talk about. Um, well, that's not no, that's not true. In the last part of his life, Abraham never took part in what I'm going to talk about. Because God, as you know, tells his friends what he's going to do. He said that explicitly in Genesis about Abraham. He said, am I going to do this and not tell my friends? And he did. 
And it's clear that he told Enoch what he was going to do because we have a quote from Enoch in the book of Jude talking about God returning, Jesus returning to establish his kingdom with armies. So Enoch knew, Job knew that there would be a resurrection and that there would be a kingdom. Abraham knew, Moses knew, you can tell in the book of Deuteronomy that God had told Moses much of what would happen in the end times. Of course, many of the prophets knew, that's how we know about them. Isaiah explicitly, the Psalms, um, and in the New Testament, Jesus' own message rang true and it was carried on by his apostles, Paul and Peter and John and the others who, who wrote parts of the New Testament and the very last verses of the entire Bible that we have talk about this part of the gospel and this dream. So let's turn to Genesis 18 and see where God says that. In Genesis 18, Abraham is sitting out. Um, well, let's let the Bible tell us what he's doing. Genesis 18, if I can actually get there. old hands. Oh, please, I really can't turn the page. So I guess there's a value in bookmarks. There we go. Verse 1, the Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. And Abraham had been through quite a bit at this point. He'd been through Hagar, he'd been through um, other messages from God, but he was sitting there contemplating. Uh, he was a man of action. He didn't spend his time sitting around, but he lived out in what we would call the country, and he thought about many things, and, and he looked up, and he saw three men standing nearby, and they came to him. They had a meal together. They were friends. Sarah was there. He told them that she would have a daughter. She laughed. They said, don't laugh. She said, I didn't laugh, and they said, you'll name him Isaac, which means he laughs. Um, so in our own heritage, that story it, it continues. It, but when you get to verse 17, the men get up to leave. Abraham walked along with them to see on their way. And in verse 17, the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Because Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all the nations on earth will be blessed through him. And we can read more and more about that. Well, it's not until the book of Hebrews in chapter 11 that we find out what Abraham was dreaming of. And it's very explicit because really we're, we're jumping from that same story to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 11. And it's talking about Abraham. And in Hebrews 11, verse 11, it says, by faith. So Abraham, and it's talking about that story. He was already a man of faith. He was there even though um, he had many things left to do in his life. By faith, Abraham, even though he was past age and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become a father because he considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he was as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. And that's part of the story. It's yet to happen, um, even though he's, he has many descendants today, it has yet to be fulfilled in its completion. But if you go to verse, um, nine we will read about what abraham actually believed it says by faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country he lived in tents he lived in tents <laughs> that's what it says as did isaac and jacob who were heirs with him of the same promise and this is the promise that they had and it's in verse 10 for he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is god the city. Abraham lived in beautiful nature and dreamed of a city. That's what kept him going. And not just, just Abraham. If you go down to 39 after a verse of all our predecessors in the faith, it says these were all commended for their faith, yet none of them had received what had been promised. And what did they not receive that had been promised? God had planned something better for us that only together with us would they be made perfect. It was the city. That was what they all had. That was the vision that was before them. And it seems like a strange thing because we have come to associate cities with bad and out in the country with good. And there's a reason for that. It doesn't have to be that way. But cities, in uh, you know, at least before, were the, 
where all the crime was, where all the pollution was, where all the problems were, where human nature was piled together and focused up and it didn't turn out well. I mean, the bad things were in the cities. And the main reason that the country was good is that there just weren't as many people out there. Um, we have found out that in a world of communications that just as much crime is in the rural areas as it is in the cities. And in some ways, the people in rural areas don't live as well as people in the city. You could argue about that, but um, it's happened. And in 2020, that's the way that it is. And yet Abraham dreamed of a city. Really, Enoch did too. He saw, saw God coming down from heaven. Job, Moses, they've all dreamed of a city. It's the city of God. It's the holy city. It's another way of saying the kingdom, but it's a little more special than that. It's not all of the city is part of the kingdom, but not all of the kingdom is part of the city. And we sing about it. If you turn to Psalm 46 and verse 4, many of the Psalms talk about a city, and sometimes I think it passes us right by. Many of, of the lyrics that we sing from the Psalms uh, explicitly talk about the city. In Psalm 46, it says in verse 4, There is a river whose streams make glad the city of our God. And we sing this in the, the, both in God is our refuge and our strength. And then there is another hymn we sing, which I can't place right now. But it, in verse 4, There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the most high dwells. And it goes on to talk about that more. And if you go down to Psalm 48, the whole psalm is about the city. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise in the city of our God. Dun, da, 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 da. Does it ring a bell? You sing it. In the city of our God. It is beautiful in its loftiness, the joy of the whole earth. Like the utmost heights of Zaphon, which is in heaven, is Mount Zion. The city of the great God. God is in her citadels. He has shown himself to be her fortress. This city is our heritage. In Psalm 60 and also in Psalm 108, and let's turn to Psalm 108, which quotes Psalm 60. Psalm 108 is two other psalms put together, but it's talking about end times. It takes, it takes a, the, the verses of two different psalms and combines them together into a new song. And in Psalm 108, it talks about my heart is steadfast, O God. I will sing and make music with all my soul. Awake, harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. This is Wake My Heart. This is the lyrics to Wake My Heart. Uh, although I added things from the New Testament also. And it's about the end times. But it, the question down in verse 10 and the longing in their hearts and what they're asking God to do in verse 10 is who will bring me to the fortified city? Who will lead me to Edom? And Edom, at least, in, at least symbolically, has traditionally been the location of what we call the place of safety. We don't know if this is literal or if it's a metaphor, but, it, but the city is real. Who will bring me to the fortified city? There will be a city before Jesus Christ returns. Also, we know there will be one after. And most of the Psalms we sing about are after God has come, after the thousand years. Um, if you turn to Psalm 87, this will be the last psalm that we hit for the moment. But this is one that's well known to you. This is the psalm that we get the words for glorious things of thee are spoken from. And you can sing that by heart. And uh, um, I want you to just go over the words in your heart while I say them. Glorious things of thee are spoken. Zion, city of our God. That's the dream. That's the aim. That's what we're aiming for. And you see, Zion is to the world what, well, no, let me, let me, let me say this a different way. Zion is to God's kingdom what a city is to the rest of the world. Sometimes we get confused about what Zion is, and we think that it's, we think that it's a, another word for Israel, and it's not. Zion is something else inside Israel, and it's different from Jerusalem. Zion is a city. By definite, whatever Zion is, the, 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 most, um, the smallest we can say of it is that it's definitely a city. It is a called out group of people who have lived their life on this earth, who in the world tomorrow will be representing God. Even if they don't live in the city, they will be representing the city. And so prophetically, when you talk about Zion, that's God's people. 
it's not just the nation of Israel. It's people who have lived out a certain way, who have had a dream in their hearts that God has given them, who have followed it to death or till Jesus Christ returning and are then part of Zion. Zion, city of our God. Zion will always be special. And it doesn't mean that people who become part of the kingdom later can't also be part of Zion. I mean, it's, it's a land of opportunity. But Zion is special. And Zion is that city that we dream of. And you know, it's something for us to think about. What would that city be like? Because again, we're used to cities being bad, but cities can be good. And sometimes when I am trying to get to sleep, I often have trouble getting to sleep and I will, uh, you know, I will recite the Ten Commandments to make sure that I still know them and the fruits of the Spirit and the 23rd Psalm and some other scriptures that I've remembered. But then I often start thinking of the city. And I think of how good it can be and what vision Jesus Christ must have of that city where it's a beautiful place for settling with houses and a peaceful gathering of homes and families and barns and shops and schools and meeting places, but also gardens and fields. There's a land to work. There's air to breathe. The climate is wonderful uh, when, when it needs to be and not if it needs some balance in that department. The river never goes dry. We know there will be a river. And there's, there's food for everyone. There's housing for everyone. Everyone is, takes care of each other. Um, the homes are crafted by craftsmen because you have all the time in the universe to make them beautiful. You can keep making them better. Um, people feel free and people feel welcome and they can dwell in a loving supportive community their children can wander safely you know how beautiful that is and it used to be the norm i mean i don't want to say when i was a kid but when i was a kid children could kind of wander safely my parents took me to the new york world's fair and said see you in three days that's not quite true i mean i checked in at the hotel room every night but they just let me wander occasionally i would find them if I wanted an advance on my allowance or something, but it could be done. Or we would get on our bikes at 8 a.m. and show up again for supper time because we'd had lunch somewhere else at that point. That's the way the world was. Well, children could wander safely. People would take care of their old people. People would take care of people who needed help. Their gardens would be blessed. They would live by law. Their hands will do good work. They will make good things for each other and for the glory of our great God. Their tongues would utter nothing but the truth. When you talk to people, you'll know you're hearing the right thing. And when your leaders talk to you, you'll know you're hearing the right thing expressed in love. And then the evenings, I like to think that there would be recreation, that there would be games, that there would be music, that people would haul out the guitars and the violins and and possibly in the kingdom, even an accordion or two, it could happen. But that it would be songs that would grow out of people's hearts and in that city, and it would be a paradise to live in. This is what I want to see, but none of it is real. And God, God wants to see it too. This is the hunger that is in my heart and should be the hunger in, in all of our hearts, that we could have that kind of community. And even if we don't live in that city, we would be representatives of that city wherever we are. And, and the kingdom, the part of the kingdom that we would be see, overseeing, and, and it would be just as good as that because God wants all kinds of cities. You know, they don't all have to be the same. We're, we're very different, and, and different cultures could grow up. But wherever we are, we will represent that central city, that central throne by the river, that city that eventually will be lit by the light of God and the Lamb themselves. We dream of a world like that. It can be a good thing, and, and I wish it were a simple thing to achieve. In some ways, all of history is about that, about people striving for the good and how it's been stifled and how human nature has, has come in the ways of it. But when Jesus Christ walked in Galilee and when he spoke of the kingdom, he was speaking of that kind of thing. He was speaking of all the good that people could be. And so... We have to dedicate ourselves now in this terrible world. There was a woman in Montana who used to say, in this old pig iron world, and I never knew what she meant. And to this day, I don't know what she meant by a pig iron world. But I kind of knew what she meant. I mean, a pig iron world is a tough one where I don't really, 
really want to live. Pig is pig iron is the unprocessed iron. And I don't know where she got that phrase in Montana because we didn't have steel mills there, but it's always stuck with me. But during these hard times when we don't know what to do, we have to dedicate ourselves to the building of the city and not just in the future, but now. We have to tell ourselves, we have to read those Psalms. We have to keep that dream in our hearts. You know, the Psalms of Ascents, uh, many of you know that I wrote choir pieces that were performed. It's Psalms 121 through 134. They're all about going up to a city and keeping the feasts of God. And part of this story is, is told to us in the feast. And that's one reason why the upcoming Holy Days and the, and the Feast of Tabernacles and, and what we call the last great day and beyond is so important right now because it keeps that dream in our own hearts. It's important that we tell the story to ourselves. It's important that we tell it to other people. And by other people, I mean the other citizens of Zion, our brothers and sisters. If you'll turn to Malachi, very easy to find, last book in the Old Testament. If you can find Matthew or the beginning of the New Testament, then you can find Malachi. You just turn back a page or two. There's an interesting verse that seems to just jump out of nowhere in Malachi 3, where the temple is built, the house is built, and Jesus Christ comes back to it. But in verse 17, God talks about his people who will make up Zion. And he says, they will be mine, says the Lord Almighty. This is Malachi 3, verse 17. They will be mine, says the Lord Almighty, in the day when I make up my treasured possession. I will spare them just as in compassion a man spares his son who serves him. And you will, see a, you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. And that's an important function of the city to be lit up on a hill and to show the world what righteousness and goodness can be. But the verse that I think is interesting is verse 16, and it doesn't seem to have much to do with the other things that have been going on in this, verse, in this chapter. Verse 16, it says, Then those who feared the Lord talked with each other, and the Lord listened and heard. A scroll of remembrance was written in his presence, considering those who feared the Lord and honored his name. And it seems to be partly based on conversations we have with our brothers and sisters in the church. It's a real thing, and it's going on now. I love the sermonette. Could I just say, I love the sermonette? It sounded to me like a brother speaking from his heart in a very humble and warm and godly way and saying things that would help us to see that kind of vision. I, I love the sermon, Ed, and to me it was right in, in line with Malachi 3 and verse 16, when those who feared the Lord talked with each other, and the Lord listened and heard. And of course we tell it to others, but the way we tell it to others is we build our own city now, and other people see it. Because if we just tell people about it, they'll think we're crazy. You've experienced it. You can't just walk up to someone and start telling them about the tithing system. You have to show them your life. You have to show them that you're a person with a dream and a goal, and you build your own kingdom. And we do that now. Not just people in our own church, but it's very important. And you know what? It's a good and godly thing to do it, to have a house and a garden that people see, to have a family that people go, I don't know what lights up that family, but it's something good. To have children who, who spread happiness and the good things about your family. To be hospitable, to share, to give when other people need giving. To pray for other people. That is a way to tell other people about the city, is to build it. To volunteer in your own city to do good things for other people is representing that city. And building that city, even right now, is part of the city. It's all temporary. In 20 years, whatever I have built will be gone because I'll be gone. It'll, it'll have passed on. You know, I, I think of the great uh, Thomases and I were there together. Teo was there. Other people in this room were there. In Pasadena, there was such a wonderful place. It was a, it was a beautiful part of the world where people could have houses in a wonderful climate. Now people are, are getting in their cars and driving away from it because it's a horrible place to live in many respects. But people had their gardens. We had a community. We had four or five congregations. 
Um, I used to love going to Spanish services because they needed a piano player. And I figured out that once you knew the hymn numbers and the books of the Bible, you could function real well in Spanish services. And they were nice people. And did I mention that I was 22, weighed 160 pounds, and they had a meal afterwards every Sabbath? Sometimes, sometimes I wish there were two Spanish services every day. And I met, I met wonderful people. And I would, I would, of course, we would go around to some of the outlying areas, particularly when we, when we did music or things like that. Um, why on earth was I talking about that? Building it. Oh, well. It was, it was a wonderful place. And, you know, people did have gardens and people had goats and people shared their tomatoes and things like that. It, it was a lovely place. Oh, I know, because it's disappeared. It's gone. There's still people out there who have their individual kingdoms. But that gorgeous, we called it a campus, but what was it? It was a city. It was a small kingdom. We built it and people came and saw it. And they, their breath was taken away because it was so wonderful. And sometimes they would say the buildings, the grounds are so beautiful. But sometimes they would say, what is it that lights up these young people and old people too? What is it? People were friends with people of all ages. It was the way we were. Uh, the, the matron of honor at our wedding, we had a best nan and a matron of honor. She was 67. She was an ancient person. She was so old that I couldn't even figure out how back in history far she went. I'm 67 today. I remember that, and I appreciate it when young people are nice to me. By the way, I see, I see you've gotten rid of all the little ones. I don't know how I feel about that. Uh, they'll be here. They are, and some of them are here, I think. Um, but it, it's all gone. It's moved on. So, but, so whatever you build right now is temporary. And yet, at the same time, we have to get ready for that coming city. And the way it's described is our clothes have to be white because there's entrance requirements for it. You know, if you read in the book of Revelation, well, let's go there. Chapter 21 and 22, there are entrance requirements. And it talks about people who won't be allowed in that city. Uh, verse 14 of, of Revelation 22, I think it's in another place too. But it says, blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. There's entrance requirements outside of the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, everyone who loves and practices falsehood. There's entrance requirements and we have to fulfill them now. Now, we can't do it on their own. That's part of the gospel. And this is clearly laid out in Revelation 3. If you will turn there, this is written to the church in Philadelphia, and we're a little vague on what all these chapters mean. There's various possibilities, but Jesus Christ's own words are very clear. And he says to the church in Revelation 3 and chapter 11, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. That crown is your ticket to the city. Him who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will he leave it. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem. So when you show up at the city, you'll have the name on you. And God gives us that. It's a gift. It's a gift through Jesus Christ and the Father's effort. And yet we have to pass those requirements. And so we keep the law now. And we live cleanly, and we raise our children to do the same kind of thing, and we obey God's commandments. We talk about the city with each other so that we are written in that book. But there will also be a city, and it's a temporary city. There will also be a city before Christ returns. It's a city that has to be built, and it's called the house. And we think that it will be built in a wilderness setting, although we don't know. So there's so many things that are metaphors, and, and much of prophecy, when it's fulfilled, will know what it meant. And that's why it's written there, so that when it happens, we can remember the scriptures. Just as Christ's own life fulfilled many scriptures, and people didn't understand what they meant till after the Holy Spirit revealed it to people who had seen Christ alive on earth. Well, it'll be the same way. It's described in Jeremiah 30. Um, th sometimes people think that Jeremiah 30 is about uh, the world tomorrow, but it really isn't, and I'll show you why. It's a very curious uh, cha verse, uh, chapter that God has given to Jeremiah, and God spoke directly to Jeremiah. Jeremiah's words came directly from God. 
and the Apostle John and the Apostle Paul didn't claim that. But Jeremiah said that they did. These prophets spoke the word of God. And so after, in verse 30, after sweeping problems and horrible things, uh, which was a lot of what Jeremiah had to announce to people, we come to verse 18, and it says, This is what the Lord says, I will restore the fortunes of Jacob's tents. And read these verses and see if they don't sound like something you've already heard about today. I will have compassions on his dwellings, the city will be rebuilt on her ruins, and the palace will stand in its proper place. From them will come songs of thanksgiving and the sound of rejoicing. I will add to their numbers and they will not be decreased. I will bring them honor and they will not be disdained. Their children will be as in days of old and their community will be established before me. Beautiful. Very kingdom. Very, very millennial. But it's not. And the next verse shows us that it's not. Their, their children will, uh, let's see. We read that. Their children will be as in days of old and their community will be established before me. I will punish all who oppress them. So they're living in a wilderness, uh, I'm talking metaphorically now, they're living surrounded by the world and the world is oppressing them for being this city on the hill that shines God's message out. It says their leader will be one of their own, their ruler who will rise from among them. I will bring him near and he will come close to me and for who is he who will devote himself to be close to me? Sounds like a person who's not entirely willing. It doesn't sound like a description of Jesus Christ. It sounds like a leader that will come from the end times. We don't know who he is. But God says, so you will be my people and I will be your God. And then the storm of the Lord will burst out in wrath and a driving head swirling down on the heads of the wicked. So this city that Jeremiah talked about that's so beautiful that makes my heart lift up and be, be glad is in the midst of a storm of bad things that God has to save it from. And it's also talked about in Psalm 121. I wonder if we think about what Psalm 121 is about, because we know these words very well. Psalm 121, a song of ascents. I will lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He watches over you. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. Sun harm by day, moon by night. That doesn't happen on a good earth, but it does at a time when the sun and the moon aren't behaving the way we expect them to. When there's fires, when there's terrible things going on, God will protect us. He will shade us. He will make sure that we're not harmed. The sun is a good thing, but at this point, it's a harmful thing. In verse 7, the Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life because your life is in peril at this point. This is a safe place. The Lord will watch over your coming and going both now and forevermore. So besides being a city that's built and not, not all of God's people, not all of Zion will be there before Jesus Christ returns. Besides being a city that is built to be on a hill and show the world that you don't need a Garden of Eden to build paradise. What you need is God's protection and God's way of life. And people will see it. It's described there in Jeremiah in detail with the singing and the thanksgiving and the prosperity that God will give them in these terrible times. There will also be people who will be, he will watch over their coming and their going. It will be a base for the preaching of the gospel in the end times. The people that we call the two witnesses. And that's what that's about. It's not just poetry. It's real. When you sing it, it's good to remember that. So we have to get ready for it. I pray that if that city is around in my lifetime, it might be, it might not be, that the Holy Spirit lets me see what God is doing. Because I'm the kind of person, you know, I'm a cynic. I, I go, oh, for, you know, what, what's going on? Uh, we never did it that way before. You know, Mr. Thomas didn't do it that way in Cleveland. Um, but, but I want my mind to be open so that I can say, wow, God, what on earth? I like it. You know, and I want to be part of it. And who knows? Maybe I'll be too old. Maybe I'll be dead. But I, look, I still look to it the same way that Abraham looked to it. And of course, he's not alive at this point either. But I want you to think about how God looks at this city, the city that I described, the city of people living lawfully and truthfully in prosperity and raising their families and taking care of each other and talking to each other. And why the term city is so important, because God could just come back to earth and have a castle. 
He could have a castle where he sits with a throne and he could rule everything, but that's not the way he does it. God's building a city and it's not populated with people he's made. It's populated with people who either in the end times or over the course of history, depending on which city it is, have turned to him, who have sought him out, who have believed that he existed, who have accepted his plan of coming into his family, who accepted Jesus' own sacrifice, who have said, I am going to live your way. And God can't build that city without us. So it's not just a way for us to survive in these end times. It's a way to fulfill what God wants to do. And God won't fail. It will happen. I mean, we, we can say, well, I'm, I, I can't do this on my own. And that's true. And God says the same thing. He says, you. I, remember, <laughs> I, I remember a story told about there was a man named Herman Hay in uh, Pasadena. And he was an unusual person. I, I didn't understand half of what he said. Uh, but some of the things he said were quite profound and quite interesting. And he had a very simple but still complicated way of living. And I remember one man told me, he went up to him and said, you know, Dr. Hay, you, you make me feel so inferior sometimes. And he said, well, you are. And um, <laughs> the man was kind of taken aback. And Dr. Hay said, so am I. He said, we all are. That's the way this works. God takes inferior and turns it into his children. But that's what that city will be made up of. It'll be made up of people who have come through what the English hymn calls the satanic mills, the mills of evil that have turned on this earth. The things that we don't forget on 9-11. We've come through all that and we'll be part of that city, perhaps before Christ returns, singing as he comes through the air, but certainly, certainly in the world tomorrow. God looks at the city as something that he yearns for. He wants to be with you. He wants to hear that music. He wants to be part of the process. He wants to be part of the organization. He wants you there with him. That's incredible. That's incredible that God is not going to do this without people. He could, but he's not. I have terrible news for you. Well, I have bad news and I have good news. The bad news, unfortunately, is so terrible that you may not forget it for the rest of your life. And I like to think that you'll always remember me when you do think about it. And here's the bad news. The city of God, which you will represent and you will function as representatives of, in Greek, is called the polis agion, the city polis, you know, like metropolis or Indianapolis. Polis means city. And hagion, it means holy. It means, you know, set apart. It's godly. Um, the Hagia Sophia comes from that word. Um, but, but that's what it's called in Greek. It's called the polis. The people who represent this city, who represent God, and who administer its blessings and good things, and all the good that comes from it to the rest of the world and eventually the universe, if you work out the Greek, they are called politica. They're called politicians. You are going to be politicians. That's the bad news. The, the good news is I don't think Greek's going to enter into the world tomorrow that much. And so we'll have different ways of saying it. We'll be God's representatives. But every time you get mad about politicians, you remember where that word came from. It, it, it's the administering of the city's powers and and laws. And that's part of what you will be doing. Well, I hope that you have a different concept of how good a city can be. I hope that you always remember this city and you keep it in your hearts, whether you're alive to see it in person at the returning of Jesus Christ or whether you're re resurrected to see it after the last great day when it descends from heaven. Ne oublier.